my name is Peter King, for those who don't know me, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 12th annual William C. Moran Address. This annual presentation honours the life and life of service of, as FMU remembers him, Dean Bill Moran. Uh, we're honoured today to have uh, his son Tom and Tom's wife Liz with us today. So thank you for coming and we appreciate your support and, and uh, you being here today. Um, I'd also like to just recognise uh, the first lady of Francis Marion, Folly Carter, is with us today. Uh, <laughs> uh, President Carter is, sends his regrets. He's unable to be here because he's presenting our budget to the Senate Finance Committee. And uh, they would not put that off. Um, Bill Moran came to Francis Marion College in 1978 from Winthrop University uh, into the position of Vice President of Academic Affairs. And he remained in that position until 1992, uh, before leaving and becoming the president of Lander University. He was very much respected by the faculty and staff uh, at Francis Marion, and there are many stories that people who were here at that time still tell about him. Our address today will be presented by Dr. Will Wattles. Will received his Bachelor of Economics from Tufts University and later a BA, another bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Texas in Austin. This might tell us a little bit about Will, that he's uh, got the traveling bug and moves around a little. Uh, he received his PhD in clinical psychology from USC in Columbia and eventually settled down at Francis Marion University in 1995. Will served as the Chair of Psychology from 2013 to 2019 uh, when he retired. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Will to the podium for today's presentation. Will. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. I want to thank the uh, Faculty Life Committee for choosing me to make this talk. And I want to thank Dr. Tuttle and Dr. Carter for giving me another chance. <laughs> and I want to thank you for coming inside on such a beautiful day to listen to me. I have to admit that I was a little anxious about this talk. And then I looked out here at all these familiar, friendly faces, and I got a lot anxious. Um, I was born 70 years ago, March 26, 1950, in Waterville, Maine, to a veteran studying geology at Colby College and a philosophy major from Wellesley. My parents were city folks who, despite their education, moved back to the land in 1950. We had no TV and there were no children near me, so I began school with a strong desire to learn to read so that I could entertain myself. I attended a two-room school with one teacher, Mrs. Heath, in the little room, what grades one through four, and another, Mrs. McCluskey, in the big room, five through eight. There were eight of us in my class for all eight years. On the farm, we had Sheep, horses, cows, chickens, pigs, cats, dogs, geese, and a pet crow named John Henry. About age 12, I began to raise oxen that I would use to pull logs out of the woods and show at county fairs. Life on the farm was strict, rigid, and claustrophobic. Our family of six lived in a drafty, 100-year-old farmhouse, and in the winter, only two rooms were heated. We all slept in unheated bedrooms. When I was growing up, we never went anywhere. We had animals to care for, and my parents had an aversion to travel. I read books about faraway places and dreamed of traveling. My main escape was to tromp through the woods with my dog, Ruff, 
and in the winter I would wear snowshoes. So I grew up independent, self-sufficient, and stubborn about asking for help. I've always worked. At age six, my job was to collect the eggs. And by high school, I was make, milking a cow morning and night for a dollar a week. A big event in my young life was a trip with my oxen to the Eastern States Exposition in Springfield, Massachusetts. My last two years in high school, I was on the ski team. I wasn't much of a downhill skier, but I competed in cross-country skiing and jumping. Just before I graduated, I won the Junior National Olympic Biathlon Development Race, rifle shooting and cross-country skiing, and I got my picture in Sports Illustrated. From New Vineyard, population 300, I went to Boston to go to college at Tufts University. The Tufts mascot is Jumbo, in honor of a circus elephant killed by a railroad engine. They stuffed Jumbo and put him in Barnum Hall, where I passed him on the way to biology class every day. My freshman year, I played football. Well, I was on the team. I was the lightest and slowest player and had no experience. So my action was mostly limited to practice. At Tufts, I received generous Pell Grants and loans, but still had to work. So I washed dishes for work study and got a job as a taxi cab driver for town taxi. <laughs> it was quite a rush for a kid from the woods of Maine to be given a brightly covered, colored car and sent out into the streets of Boston, which were designed before cars were invented. I had gone to Tufts thinking I wanted to be a businessman, but Tufts didn't have an undergraduate major in business, so I settled on economics. I joined a fraternity and, and developed more interest in beer and pool than academics. One semester, I attempted five courses and got two C's, an F, a W, and an incomplete. Academic probation came at no extra charge. <laughs> Under the threat of losing my deferment, I recovered from probation the next term, but was still adrift. I got in a little trouble involving drinking and driving, lost my license, and found myself back in New Vineyard, working outside at a mill, digging lumber out of snowbanks during January independent study. With temperatures that fluctuated from below zero to about 20 for the high, I considered that I was living in New Siberia and felt sorry for myself. Then I got a letter from my girlfriend who had gone to Mexico to study art for a semester. She said I should come to Mexico in a totally out of character move for the responsible oldest child, I decided to go. I went to Tufts, told them that I was Will's brother, that Will had mononucleosis and wouldn't be in school this semester. <laughs> I flew to Mexico City and caught a bus to San Miguel de Allende. I had never been anywhere, didn't know a word of Spanish, but I got there. I loved everything about Mexico. The food, language, music, architecture, hair and skin color hooked me for life. I wasn't in school and was not allowed to work, so for the first time in my life, I was free to just wander around every day. Despite my parents' fears, I returned from Mexico and started back at Tufts. But I was a new guy. I had something I wanted to learn about. I signed up for a double credit Spanish course with two instructors. A year and a half after being on academic probation, I took 24 semester hours to catch up, made Dean's List, and graduated. Technically, I graduated. 
but it felt more like college ended. I didn't attend graduation and was a little prepared for what came next, which was a 20-year struggle to find my place in the world. I would walk the streets of Boston and uh, go into tall buildings, ask for HR, and say I wanted to apply for a job. When they asked what job, I would lamely tell them that I had a degree. One place said, with a degree, you want a management trainee job. <clears throat> From then on, that's what I applied for. I knew nothing of networking, had no help or guidance, and my career struggled to be born. I began at New England Life in Boston, and then moved to a glorified clerical job at Burroughs Corporation in Worcester, Mass., and on to a Burroughs sales job in Atlanta. I left that for a job selling carpet in California that later transferred me to Dallas. In Dallas, I, gave, I quit drinking and smoking and took up running and bicycling. I tried to open a Fidipides running store in Corpus Christi, Texas, and then went to work for a Fidipides in Charlotte, North Carolina. I ran my first marathon in under three hours and then moved to Austin, Texas, where I worked for Allied Electronics. I took a summer off to ride my bicycle 2,700 miles from Austin to New Vineyard. When I got back to Austin, I decided to seek a more rewarding career. I took, at age 30, my first psychology course, and applied to the University of Texas for a PhD in psychology. I was not accepted. <laughs> I took more classes and applied the next year with the same results. I took more courses and graduated with a second BA, this time in psychology with a much better GPA. I again applied to graduate school, and this time multiple locations. I received offers with financial support from Columbia, Missouri and Columbia, South Carolina. I chose South Carolina because it was warmer. <laughs> After three years in Columbia, I completed a year-long internship at Illinois State in Normal, Illinois and graduated in 1987. I was still a wandering Gentile. My first job took me to Odessa, Texas for two years. Then I took the summer off to build a vacation home in Maine before spending a year at Georgia Southern. There were no windows in the psychology building at Georgia Southern, so I quit that tenure track job and went to work as a temporary instructor with the University of Maryland overseas on U.S. military bases. I traveled on military orders to an Air Force base in Spain and then to Army posts in Germany and later to an Air Force base in southern Italy. The next year was all in Germany, and the third year I taught on mainland Japan and the island of Okinawa. The pay was low, but vacations were amazing. Thanksgiving in Paris, Christmas in the Alps, spring break in Thailand. After that, I came back to my house in Maine and interviewed for a psychologist position at the state prison. They wanted me, but there was a bureaucratic delay, and in the meantime, I went to work at a hospital, actually the hospital where I was born. I worked four 10-hour days and skied the other three for a total of 56 days on the slopes that first year. The problem with skiing is cold weather. So in 1995, when a friend from graduate school told me there was an opening at Francis Marion, I applied. Given my track record, I didn't think I would stay long. But Fred Carter came to the university, and I met Paula. Paula and I really hit it off, and were emotionally inseparable from our second date, which was a bike ride. We got married 16 years later. <laughs> but along the way, we've been on hundreds of bike rides, kayak outings, hikes, and traveling adventures. I feel honored to be making this talk. In so many ways, Francis Marion University has been a wonderful place to spend the last 25 years of my career. 
However, I have to tell you that it is not the Department of Psychology with my great colleagues that is the best thing. Even working for a visionary, the visionary Fred Carter is not my top memory of my time here. The best thing about being at Francis Marion has been getting to know the African American staff and students. They taught me that the single story in my head about African Americans was incomplete, superficial, and just wrong. I think I tended to avoid or minimize contact with my fellow citizens who happened to be black, figuring that we wouldn't have much in common or that they might not like me. In class with students and around campus with staff, I enjoyed an increasing amount of conversation and found that people responded very warmly to me. I soon observed all the qualities I admire in people in the African Americans around me. Because I had regular contact with African Americans who were my colleagues or students studying in my field, I developed new associations and my world opened up and became richer. I wish that there were a way I could give this experience to other Caucasians. Our society remains quite segregated. For example, when I sit down to a meal, the others at the table are usually my same race. How could I hope to break down the wall between our groups? For years, I taught group therapy in our, in our clinical master's program. Group therapy has as a central principle group cohesion. Group cohesion refers to the attraction the group has for its members. Over time, members come to highly value the group and their fellows. This belongingness results in a feeling that the group is a safe place to reveal thoughts and ideas that the person is reluctant to express in public. I felt it would be valuable if I could take a group of black and white individuals and establish a safe environment where they could express thoughts about race and racism. Race is a huge issue in America, yet we rarely have the opportunity to speak frankly about it especially with, diff with, though, with people with different views or different race from our own. I began the group on a volunteer basis with an African-American undergraduate student as my co-leader. The group met for eight weeks with no academic credit. Both black and white students found the group a worthwhile experience. One of them summed it up beautifully Prior to meeting this amazing group of people, I believed that African Americans often took neutral topics and made them about race. I blamed them as a group. My clouded perspective on this, as well as other issues, unknowingly limited my close relationship to only those who resembled my skin pigmentation. Another student said, I was very glad that we had the group of students that we did because everyone was so open and willing to share, which is what I had hoped for. My group leader and I also found the experience exciting. Students suggested that it should be a class for college credit. And I received support and approval from the provost to create a special topics class. Students love this class. They write bi-weekly papers about their experience, and the papers demonstrate great awareness and growth. A typical paper comment was, this is my final year of undergrad, and I have not enjoyed a class as much as I did this one. All of us felt great relief at being able to speak frankly and safely about issues that surround us daily. One student explained it, it is a class unlike anything else. Finally, I have a real safe space with people who understand how I feel and feel similarly. The class helped raise awareness of issues related to race. As one student said, many people, including myself, I hope that's the right one, many people, including myself, 
um, don't even realize the biases they have against another race. Imagine, if you will, feeling comfortable, comfortable enough to write as this student did. This group has opened my eyes to some of the biased thoughts I have had about black people my whole life. The group provided a safe and non-judgmental setting for self-awareness. One student said, this group has really made me feel empowered to make a change in society and to speak up for what is not right. It has allowed me to listen, but also to speak up for myself. The only ground rules for the group are that everyone takes part, no one dominates, and the goal is to understand the world from a different racial perspective. It is not a debate. Teaching this class has been the high point of my career. The students have given me a new story or stories about African Americans. Now, the greatest American story. Realizing how little I knew about their lives and cultures, I began to read black history. Everyone should read black history because without it, you have an incomplete and inaccurate view of American history. The biggest benefit I received from reading black history was learning about the greatest American story. Now, it smacks of ubers to say that I alone know the greatest personal story in our history. But hear me out. We might agree that the greatest American story has to involve five things. Humble beginnings, noble causes, enormous obstacles overcome, including really bad, bad guys, personal courage, and tremendous successes. I will show you that lawyer, civil rights activist, and Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall fulfills each of these criteria. Humble beginnings. Born in 1908, he was the grandson of a slave and the son of a porter on the railroad. His mother was a school teacher, but black school teachers were paid just over half of their similarly qualified white colleagues. He and his parents lived with family members. He did not get their own home until Thurgood was in high school. From age seven, Thurgood had after school jobs, such as delivering groceries. Speaking of high school, he attended the Colored High and Training School, the only high school for African Americans in all of Baltimore. Think back to your time in high school. What would it have been like with no gym, no cafeteria, and no library? The school was so crowded that students attended in shifts. After high school, he enrolled at Lincoln University and HBCU in Oxford, Pennsylvania, about 60 miles from Baltimore. Throughout his time there, the family struggled to pay tuition, and his mother wrote frequent letters pleading for time and promising payment. To pay for college and later law school, he worked in jobs as a porter on the railroad and a waiter at Gibson Island, an exclusive and, of course, segregated club. His mother pawned her wedding and engagement rings to help pay for his law school tuition. Noble causes. Imagine what life would be like without these basic rights that concerned Thurgood Marshall throughout his career. Unrestricted travel. Famed black educator John Hope Franklin describes riding a train in North Carolina in 1945. The black passengers, including soldiers, were crammed into a crowded Negro car, while the whites only car had few passengers. When Dr. Franklin requested that the conductor allow some of them into the less crowded car, he was denied. This was despite the fact that the white passengers were German prisoners of war. Fair treatment in the courts. Despite the constitutional guarantees of a jury of his, his or her peers, black defendants frequently faced all-white juries. Similarly, they were often beaten until they confessed, and the confession being the only evidence against them. 
State-supported graduate study. Colleges and universities supported by taxpayer dollars frequently denied admission to blacks, whether academically qualified or not. Home ownership. America is viewed as a land of opportunity and a place where those born in all classes can aspire to achieve their goals. This opportunity is often called the American dream and home ownership is a key element of it. Home ownership is important because it allows a person to strive for success through hard work and savings to a better quality of life, the accumulation of wealth, and the passing on of something to children. Marshall encountered many laws and customs that limited the ability of African Americans to pursue home ownership. Access to a public park, beach, or golf course is one of the simple pleasures of life that many of us are often too busy to enjoy. All were frequently off limits to blacks, even though they were supported by taxes and otherwise open to the public. Blacks were welcomed as labor only. Freedom of association. The US Constitution protects the fundamental freedom to engage in association for the advancement of beliefs and ideas. In a free society, any person has the right to associate with any other person or persons willing to associate with him or her for any reason. Yet, South Carolina passed laws prohibiting the hiring of members of the NAACP. Alabama passed a law requiring the revealing of membership roles so that those who joined the NAACP could be fired from their jobs and harassed. Service in a restaurant. Throughout the South, states passed laws to block blacks from public places, including most restaurants. The vote. Marshall spent enormous amounts of time and energy combating the many ingenious and creative ways that officials, mostly in the South, devised to prevent African Americans from voting. I have always been allowed to vote and cannot really imagine what it must be like not to have that right. Equal pay. Black school teachers in most of Maryland and many other states were paid less than half of what white teachers with similar qualifications received. In many cases, African American teachers with college degrees and often graduate degrees received less than the janitors at the white schools. These were the issues that Thurgood Marshall, in a suit and tie, fought for within the judicial system with the U.S. Constitution as his main tool. Enormous obstacles overcome. Marshall attended segregated schools, including a high school so crowded that students attended in shifts. Yet, he was able to star on the debate team and prepare himself for college. He nearly was not admitted because his family owed tuition for his older brother, Aubrey. The university thought Thurgood should wait until Aubrey's debt was clear. His mother persuaded a minister and a graduate of Lincoln to advocate for him. Marshall graduated from high school a semester early and working as a waiter on the railroad was able to earn money to pay his tuition. In college at Lincoln University, he was a star on the debate team, which took part in the first interracial debate in the country against Penn State University. Still, money was always an issue. After college, Thurgood rose at 5 a.m. to walk to the train station to travel from Baltimore to Howard University Law School in Washington. The University of Maryland Law School was 10 minutes away by trolley, but he didn't apply there because they did not accept blacks. When he finished law school, and began to practice law, he had difficulty renting an office because many landlords did not rent to African Americans. You cannot file a lawsuit without a plaintiff, and a teacher who sued for equal pay would likely lose his or her job. Marshall found a county where teachers had tenure and thus could not be fired and thought he had a plaintiff. The school district, unable to fire the man, offered him a job as principal causing him to lose tenure, and then fired him that job two years later. 
When defending blacks charged with crimes in, in civil cases in the South, Marshall had to ride on segregated trains and buses and often could find no restaurant or hotel that would serve African Americans. He often stayed at private homes of supporters, moving every night for safety. In some cases, his hosts were threatened to the point that he had to drive long distances to a community with hotels open to blacks. When appearing in criminal cases or suing in civil court for constitutional rights, he usually encountered all white juries that were largely segregationists. For example, when defending four boys charged with rape in Groveland, Florida, he faced an all-white jury. The prosecutor, judge, and sheriff were all avowed segregationists. After the alleged rape, an armed mob of men, including some law enforcement personnel, descended on the courthouse to lynch two of the suspects who fortunately had been moved to the state prison. The mob shot at homes of blacks, most of whom had run away into the woods and swamps. The National Guard was called as cattle trucks filled with armed men began entering the area and throwing bottles of gasoline into the abandoned homes of the blacks. Though all were known to the sheriff, none of the rioters were arrested. When the trial began, the judge refused a motion for change of venue, and some of the mob probably served as jurors. The alleged victim of the rape was examined by a physician whose report did not support her allegations. The segregationist judge did not allow the medical report in the trial, and similarly prohibited testimony about the beatings the boys had endured at the hands of law enforcement. It cost money to try cases in court. Marshall relied on support from the NAACP, which received most of its operating money from blacks who purchased membership in the organization. Marshall traveled a great deal, making speeches and seeking donations to raise funds. Meanwhile, his adversaries seemed willing to spend whatever taxpayer dollars were needed to defeat efforts to achieve civil rights. Courageous behavior. Marshall received threats constantly and was often unable to trust law enforcement to protect him. But still, he journeyed to the South to represent the innocent. In Columbia, Tennessee, he and his colleagues defended black men so innocent that an all-white jury released them. After the trial, Marshall, two lawyers and a reporter, got in the car and headed north to Nashville where they had been staying for safety reasons. A few miles down the road, they were pulled over by several police cars. Marshall was taken from the car and accused of drunk driving, despite having had no alcohol. He was put in a car and taken back toward Columbia and the others told to leave town. Soon, the car with Marshall turned down a dirt road toward the Duck River, where a lynch party waited. However, the other lawyers had followed and refused to leave without Marshall. Intimidated by witnesses, the police then took Marshall to a magistrate who released him. A police chief in Dallas threatened to kill Marshall, but was thwarted by a Texas Ranger assigned by the governor to protect Marshall. Called names, vilified, and threatened, Marshall nevertheless traveled constantly to the South to defend the accused to seek legal solutions to segregation. On Christmas Day, 1951, KKK members bombed the home of Marshall's friend and colleague, killing Harry T. Moore and his wife, Henrietta. Marshall had spent the night in their house. Arguably, the most courageous thing Marshall did was to go before the Senate Judiciary Committee, where seven of the 16 members, including the chair, were powerful Southern segregationists who considered Marshall a public enemy of the South. For five days, they came at him with every imaginable strategy to evoke an angry response. But he maintained his composure and was finally approved for a seat on the Supreme Court. Historic successes. 
Thurgood Marshall, working with many others, defended blacks in criminal and civil cases all over the nation, especially in the hostile South. He argued 32 cases in front of the Supreme Court of the United States and won 29 of them. I want to briefly cite a few to demonstrate some of his successes. Marshall argued his first major case in Murray versus the University of Maryland in 1935. Donald Murray, was, Donald Murray was a resident of Maryland who was a Dean's List graduate of Amherst College in Massachusetts. He applied to the University of Maryland Law School and was denied solely because he was black. There was no state law school for blacks. In a rare victory at the state level, the judge ruled that Murray had to be admitted. This first ever instance of court-ordered desegregation of a public school was upheld by the Maryland Court of Appeals. Marshall had demonstrated his knowledge of constitutional law and confronted the tax-supported school that should have been available to him. This case opened the door to graduate education for qualified blacks, a huge step on the road to equality. In Smith versus Allwright, Marshall took on the all-white Democratic primary. After the Civil War, Southern states turned their back on the party of Lincoln, and most state races were decided by the Democratic primary. Thus, blacks could be allowed to vote in the general election, but have no real say in the selection of leaders. Marshall lost at the state level, but the Supreme Court ruled that white primaries were illegal. In Patton versus Mississippi, the Supreme Court ruled that indictments and verdicts rendered by juries from which blacks had systematically been excluded were not legal. African Americans had long been denied justice by trial before their peers. South Carolina's Democratic Party required voters to sign an oath to support the social, religious, and educational separation of the races. In Elmore versus Rice, the courts ruled that membership to political parties had to be open to all without any such oath. In Shelley versus Kramer, the court concluded that state enforcement of racial covenants, such as those prohibiting ownership of a home by blacks or Jews, violated the 14th Amendment. Now African Americans could buy it, could pursue the American dream and buy homes if they had the money. Marshall's biggest and most famous victory was in Brown versus the Board of Education. Marshall found plaintiffs in Clarendon County, South Carolina, 40 miles down the road, brave enough to file a suit. That suit, combined with others around the country, challenged the very notion of separate but equal. Um, in a unanimous decision, the Supreme Court ruled that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal and therefore violate the equal protection cause of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. In 1955, Marshall continued his assault on separate but equal. In Mayor and City Council of Baltimore versus Dawson, the Supreme Court concluded that segregated beaches, bathhouses, and parks were illegal. Later that year, in Holmes v. Atlanta, the court outlawed segregation at public golf courses. Almost done. In 1960, Boynton versus Virginia led to a ruling that restaurants and bus stations could not discriminate against travelers. Finally, in NAACP versus Alabama, the Supreme Court ruled that a citizen has a right to join an organization and that requiring the release of memberships list, membership lists impinges on that freedom of association. In 1961, Marshall was appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals by President Kennedy. Four years later, Lyndon Johnson named him United States Solicitor General, making him the highest ranking African-American government official in history. In 1967, he became the first African-American member of the Supreme Court, where he served for 24 years. Before I came to Francis Marion, I knew little of Thurgood Marshall. Now, I find it difficult to imagine the difference between the world of young Thurgood Marshall and the way it is today 
because of his efforts. I looked around at graduation last fall and noticed the patchwork quilt of black, white, and brown faces mixed together in shared pride at the class of 2019. The dire predictions of segregationists that public accommodations would give a green light to anarchy were clearly in error. Author Will Hagrid called Marshall an evangelist on behalf of the law. The changes that resulted from his legal work allowed America to truly become the land of opportunity. The dismantling of legal segregation put America on track to do as Cleveland Sellers said at fall commencement, rewrite our national narrative to include African Americans. This is important, not only for the individual. These bright young people would have been denied the opportunity to achieve their potential. Also, all of us benefit from empowering the most talented and energetic people, not just the most talented white males. In summary, Theodore Roosevelt said, far and away the best prize that life offers is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. Despite my struggles and wrong turns, I won that prize and I made it to that employee promised land. I hope my work added to human understanding and kindness. As I taught hundreds of students, they taught me, and I retire with a new story and a richer life that includes a new hero in Thurgood Marshall. He grew up from humble beginnings to make life better for millions of people of all races, and in the words of Langston Hughes, to let America be America again. Thank you.